What's up folks, Renfail here, and Force Gaming has a really cool overview video of what he got to experience at, I'm assuming it's PAX, um, where he was at present at the Dune Awakening exclusive presentation that they showed, and he's got some great details in here. There's no NDAs being broken or anything like that, it's just general information from the event, plus some screenshots, which have already been shared across social media. They're also in the Dune Awakening Discord, so if you're not over there in the Discord, you should totally get involved, because I can also say... <laughs> But Discord is really cool, um, and everybody from the Funcom team is super active over there uh, around this game. Um, they were really just having a blast over the last few days doing all the GDC and PAX co conference stuff. So if you're following along with the adventures on X slash Twitter, cool, but it's even better in the Discord. And now that the whole team's home, all I can say is that today, before I recorded this video, I had done another uh, a, a reaction video. And I'm recording this on the afternoon of the 27th, and the Discord was just blowing up, and somebody linked this video in the Discord, which is how I knew that Forced Gaming had a video up on this, because um, I hadn't actually checked YouTube yet for his reaction to things. So, anyway, he's got a video. He's going to talk about some things. They're going to share some screenshots. I'm looking forward to it. Let's do a reaction video. Uh, yeah? Is there anything else I need to talk about before we go? No, let's just let's just do this. Let me move this out of the way, get my chair. Hey everyone, welcome back. So recently we got to take an early look at Dune Awakening, the upcoming survival sandbox MMO from Conan Exile and Secret World developer Funcom. This was a hands-off event, meaning we didn't get to actually play the game, unfortunately. But we did see a 30-minute presentation and gameplay walkthrough, during which we not only saw the game running in action, but also got a bunch of new information and details. Let's take a look. So they open things up by showcasing the early portions of the game, beginning with character creation. Dune Awakening looks to offer... So this is one of the first official new screenshots. This is a screenshot from character creation. Um, honestly, and I think he says this here in a second in the video, um, this is standard. We've seen all of this um, before in terms of other games. What's really interesting, and I don't know if he's going to talk about because I haven't watched the full video yet. I've, I've been reading online that Part of the character creation stuff that was shown was like choosing your background, what planet you were from, and how that impacts your stats and other things for your character. So it's really cool to know that we got a pretty in-depth lore-specific, this is important, lore-specific um, content uh, character creator, which is awesome. For the expected suite of customization options with sliders for your height, body parts, face, hair, eyes, and other features. The general look of characters appeared and was also said to be directly inspired by the recent Dune films. And you Perfect. can kind of see that in how the characters are designed and, and their presentation and all of that. So after deciding how you look, uh, you then get to choose your backstory and the starting class. Now the backstory includes where you were born. Up, up, up. This is one I haven't seen. Um in detail yet so you're getting to choose uh your planet so this person is saying i'm from kaladin from na familia a secretive and insular organization the order of mentats and then you're choosing over here you're choosing your class you're going to be a mentat a trooper a sword master or a benny jesseret acolyte ho 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 oh i can't wait guys i'm so excited as well as your cast, which determines... This is... I'm just... I'm so excited. Like, the idea of being able to say, I'm from Caladan. Those words, for those of us who have read the books and grew up with this story over the years and seen all of the iterations from David Lynch's version to the Sci-Fi Channel to Denise's most recent versions, Dune is a rich world equal to Lord of the Rings in every way in Middle-Earth, and I can't wait to sink my teeth in. This looks amazing things like your dialogue traits and unique emotes. The dialogue traits are said to provide additional <coughs> options when you're speaking with NPCs. So think like Bethesda style here, where you'll be granted different responses to questions NPCs ask you, depending on your backstory, your history, your cast, your birth location, all of that. And that I can also say there were some interesting conversations about that part of the game in Discord the other day with a bunch of the developers talking about it. So another reason there are the yeah, classes. Get over now, there. there were four options to choose from from what we saw. By the way, I'm so there. there. The Tag me if you want. Who's Say all about hi. Recon and strategy. Their starting ability uh, is assess weapons, which lets them scan enemies and objects in the environment, granting information about them. Then there was the trooper class, which is all about offense and demolition. Their starting ability, shiga wire cable, is basically a grapple hook. You shoot a bar, but attaches to a surface and then pulls you towards it. Nice. Then there was the sword master class, who is about close quarters aggression. Their starting ability 
ability Deflection has them entering a defensive stance to deflect ranged attacks. And then the final class was the Bene Gesserit Acolyte, which is about physical mastery and manipulation. Their starting ability is Voice Compel, which mm. uses the voice to force someone towards your position from afar. Sounds so good. it does seem like they are going with clear different archetypes here for uh, tailored towards different play styles after they finish. Yeah, but they also said that all of the skills, like that's just kind of like a starting kind of like Bethesda and you're not locked into a class per se. It's just this is your starting group of skills and from there you'll be able to do whatever you want within that ranking. But there are certain things like if you're a Mentat, you definitely have a specific set of abilities. Um, so it's, it is weird like an archetype, but you can go anywhere you want archetype. Finished creating a character, there was a series of cutscenes at the end of which we see the player wake up inside of a cave. Now here you go through the typical basic survival game tutorial, being introduced to the fundamentals of movement, combat, gathering, and crafting. Here's a few notes from what we saw. Uh, nice. The first item that you grab in the game is called the Frem Kit. This is a backpack that also acts like a mobile crafting station, letting you build your starter weapons, tools, and consumables. All the usual stuff here. Collect resources in the environment, use those to craft items. At the beginning, you can make like a makeshift melee weapon. There's a glow stick to see better in the dark, as well as the ability to heal with bandages. There's also a radial wheel in the game, so you can slot items to be able to quickly swap between them. These nice. appear to be key bound as well, with eight total slots available. The game features a free climbing system where you can climb anywhere you are able to scale, we were told. all. That's, that's directly from Conan Exiles, I believe. Um... So that's a system they've already there are they've already mastered that system. Same thing with melee combat. They've already done melee combat very well in uh, in uh, Conan Exiles. So it's going to be interesting to see how a lot of that stuff translates over here structures and terrain in the game. The developer actually specifically said that they brought over the climbing system that was created for Conan Exiles and then there. have combined that with a series of additional features like suspensor belts and the grappling hooks that allow for a ton more freedom of movement beyond just scaling walls. Upon emerging from the cave, oh, those, saw oh, another cutscene. Now they did make note here that the game has quite a big emphasis on the story. There are a lot of uh, cutscenes and, and dialogues that take place as you play through the main story quest line that unfolds before you reach into the end game that is so good to hear because one of the things that i am extremely passionate about for long-term viewers you already know this but for the new viewers cinematic storytelling gets me so hard like i love cinematic storytelling like if you give me cut scenes and narration and voiceovers and motion capture and all that stuff like i am enthralled so please take me my body is yours dude awakening game after that we saw the player out in the middle of the sand which then introduced us to a few more of the survival mechanics so they did say that when you're out amongst the dunes walking on open sand any movement or action will draw the attention of sandworms at that point we saw one such sandworm emerging from right behind the player it was clearly a cutscene. it was set up for this moment but it's just again the introduction to the sandworm mechanic now beyond avoiding the worms you are also whoa what do we got here we have ui screenshot press j to track a new journey we've got um up on the top here um a ui element for your quest tracker over here behind my head looks like i see something for health energy stamina and i'm assuming that's water so one of those might be food one of those is definitely water and shade and then on the bottom right i'm seeing like a sword or some sort of a weapon uh, and then, of course, your compass. So having to manage your heat level at all times. So any time spent standing in direct sunlight quickly builds up this temperature gauge. And once the bar is full, you receive the sunstroke debuff, which then quickly drains your water. And finding water and maintaining your water levels appears to be one of the primary survival mechanics in this game. So they say you're going to want to stay out of the sun. You're going to need to search for water. And water can be found from various sources. You're going to be able to pull water from plants to a certain level and then after that, you will actually need to consume pure water or get water from the blood of wildlife, NPCs, and other players. There's another great There's screenshot. Also resource harvesting, as you expect. You'll harvest resources from things in the environment, as well as the ability to salvage That's great. materials from metal objects. Hang on, we're going to go back to that. In the environment. We're get, we got two and screenshots. Hold up. Resource water from the blood of wildlife, and. All right, so this is one of their. Um, Right. And I did see this screenshot before. We've got a couple of people on a bike. You can see their names represented over here. 
Um, and then there's their temperature gauge in the middle, and then we've got t uh, controls over on the right-hand side of the screen. Other players. There's also resource harvesting, as you expect. You'll harvest resources. Granite stone, um, craft a place of respawn beacon. So it looks like it's going to have a very similar, you remember the intro to Conan Exiles, it gives you the quest to like build this, build this, build this. It looks like that's all going to be here to get you going, which is very, very good. Um, mine, scan, definitely seeing lots of elements on the UI here. Sources from things in the environment, as well as the ability to salvage materials from metal objects. Oh, using cool. this tool called the Cutter Ray. And they've actually opted for using one of the more interactive ways of harvesting. So rather than just say clicking E to harvest materials from something you're standing in front of, you actually scan any object that's harvestable. This will reveal its weak points as a line. And then you have to trace along that line to actually harvest materials from it. And they mentioned that as you progress through the game, the rarer materials materials will have more complex patterns for you to trace. Next, we got to take a look at the enemy outpost. These are locations that will be full of valuable loot, resources, collectibles, and of course, NPCs for you to stalk and eliminate. NPCs, and this is where baby. stuff gets interesting for me because I love clearing out enemy camps in pretty much any open world game, any survival game, whatever. This is one of the kind of gameplay systems that I really like engaging with. Uh, before we dive into that though, here's a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Marvel Rivals, a new competitive superhero. I saw this mentioned today. Shooter, where you can choose from a vast array of iconic Marvel characters from Guardians of the Galaxy to Avengers to X-Men and many more. Because someone was Whether saying you could play uh, Magneto as the Incredible here. Hulk, unleashing high power tech weaponry as Iron Man, or swinging into action as the Spider-Man, there's a character for every playstyle, complete with deep lore that fans of the Marvel Marvel Universe are sure to enjoy. In Marvel Rivals, teamwork is key. You'll coordinate with allies to execute unique team-up abilities between heroes to turn the tide. Whether it's Groot and Rocket linking up for a devastating combo, or Iron Man and Hulk joining forces to unleash powerful attacks, strategic collaboration is essential. And it's not just about the heroes, the environment plays a role as well. Marvel Rivals features destructible environments, allowing you to leverage the map to your advantage. Witness Black Panther strategically destroying a bridge to cut off the enemy's path, creating dynamic and unexpected scenarios. To discover more about Marvel Rivals and get access to the first closed alpha test, be sure to check out the link in the description below. All right, now let's talk about NPC bases and the game's combat. At this point, they actually swapped to another character, showing us a different class in action. They had crafted what is called a passive suspensor belt, and this basically let them glide or hover. Oh, so that's what we're seeing in these is the belts. Now, I, I'm assuming you're going to be able to give those to other players because it shows different archetypes, different classes using these to float down. For any time they jumped into the air uh, off of an object. What was neat about this, though, is that this action actually preserves momentum. So we saw the player use a grapple hook to quickly pull themselves up onto a ledge and then they activated the suspensor belt which had them gliding, carrying that momentum, which basically kind of slingshot them up into the air, that letting them go cool. further than they would be able to otherwise had they just used the grapple hook life to see this kind of more interesting and engaging traversal mechanics in fact at this point the developer said that their goal was to try to make traversal fun and engaging because moving around the environment is one of the things you'll be doing most besides gathering crafting and doing the combat you're going to be spending a lot of time moving around so using these tools and abilities combined with the free climbing system gives players the ability to approach many encounters however they like and they said as an example you know a lot of outposts will be in like these outcroppings or rock formations so yeah yeah, you can walk in the front door of the outpost and start taking out enemies uh, head on, or you can climb up and kind of fall in from above, sneaking around or, you know, however you want to Perfect. approach it. But All they right. want to have a lot of variety while also making the traversal feel engaging rather than just climbing a rock wall. You got the grapple hook, you got the uh, levitation ability with and, and different other class skills that you'll be able to use that play into more engaging and dynamic traversal mechanics. I'm also a big fan in general of verticality in games and the more verticality we have in terms of of 3D spaces, it's always going to feel bigger than just running through um, a linear space that's only on the same plane. Uh, it feels much bigger this way. Once inside the outpost, we got to see some combat and action. So the player snuck around for a little bit in a crouch position, moving around the base stealthily before pulling out to this Mala pistol to take out a few patrolling guards. So the character that we saw was actually the trooper class, and they had. Oh, look at look at the navigator ship up there, everybody. So I think that Denis film um, portrayed those in a really, really, really impressive manner. The size and scale of how big they are compared to the planet. This screenshot right here is 
chef's kiss had the grapple hook ability as well as a just regular frag grenade. Now at this point we were told that in addition to any ranged and melee weapons that you use in combat, at any given time you can select three active skills and three passive skills to have currently equipped out of a variety of options. There are classes as we mentioned, with those classes come skill trees, and from those trees you can kind of pick... Okay, here's what we're looking for. So... Skill trees, battlefield calculation, use a skin to write enemies and objects. Enemies will show their archetype and traps will show the damage type they deal. Okay, that's cool. And choose what you want. Although you choose a starting class, it seems like you do have the option to pull skills, uh, active and passive abilities from the other class trees as well. I exactly. Think there's some sort of limitation. That's the Bethesda like you method. You can only fully specialize in your starting class, but you can still pick some of the earlier skills in the other tech trees. And the combat that they showed uh, seemed fine enough. Now, nothing really stood out, either for better or worse. I will say I thought the sounds and the impact animations, like the how the enemy AI reacted to being hit and shot in combat that looked decent if anything on the negative side i would say the character movement appeared a little bit stiff it didn't really seem bad by any means but it just looked a little rigid that that's just well that's also just stuff that they can polish over time too because they're still in you know their alpha phase or beta phase i guess you should say so there's still more polish to be in an optimization something i took note of while we were watching this overall though it seemed fun enough uh, watching the character move through the environment uh, sneak around take out enemy npcs with ranged and melee using their skills tossing grenades it seemed competent. It seemed like it would be a relatively fun time. After spending a little time on the trooper class, they then swapped back to the original character, showing us the Mentat class in action and how they might approach taking on an outpost. He had access to this ability called Battlefield Calculation, which was more or less an air... Is that... That's not specifically an ornithopter. That is like a carrier. Are they carrying... It looks like they're carrying like a harvester or something area scan that marks NPCs showing you their location as well as their class archetype be it assault support whatever after scanning the enemies he then summoned in a hunter seeker which is basically a drone that you manually have control of and you have an ability that is able to one shot any of the game's basic enemies uh, now moving on we got player bases and construction so they introduced us to the base building system of which they said they took the foundation of what Conan Exiles did tried to identify some of its flaws and then refined it into a better version for Dune Awakening. So to start out, you place down a totem on the ground, and this is basically marking the area in which you can build. At that point, you're able to do the typical... Yeah, this is your... You're gonna, And then now you're just going to add... You're just going to add ingredients to it. Um, okay. So once you've got a structure in place, it'll be like red or green until you've added all the stuff to it, which I think we've seen in Valheim, Conan Exiles, so on and so forth base construction stuff you'll place foundations walls doors stairs and roofs in whatever configuration you please they are making use of a hologram system for base construction so how this works is that you select a building piece and place it and then a hologram appears at that point that hologram can be filled and completed by anyone who brings the resources to it. Uh, this is a great multiplayer method of doing base building. Yeah. I have loved it in other survival games, th this idea that you can place the template and then your teammates working together can help fill it instead of people gonna having be great. to do each piece individually. You We're also have access to a special tool that lets you make blueprints of any building in the game. So what they said is that you can copy an exact structure that you like. If you see a structure in the environment, you're able to copy it and then it lets you place it elsewhere in the world and then just fill in the hologram parts yourself this that's really cool i wonder if they've been any npc structure or if it's also going to be other player built structures or how that's going to work but the idea that you can copy other blueprints and build things that you find in the wild is really, really cool because then you can basically you're kit bashing at that point where you're mixing and matching your own things and stacking them on top of existing blueprints that you've copied over that's really cool this even lets you do things like pre-build structures that you can take with you on the go and drop to fill quickly. This will be especially useful in PvP zones where you don't want to spend a, a ton of time manually building a base piece by piece. You can go into a PvP zone with like a set PvP structure, place it, and then quickly fill it with the resources so long as you have them. Again, instead of trying to build it by hand while you're also trying to keep an eye out for other players. Player crafting. Lots of different crafting and refining stations. Pretty much what you expect. There'll be uh, various purifiers, fabricators, refineries 
batteries and storage. As you level up in the game, you'll earn these technology points. And then those baby. points are spent in a tech tree that unlocks the various crafting stations. In addition to the tech tree, they also told us that there will be unique schematics that are only found while exploring and looting out in the open world. That's typical and these will for include MMOs. things like better versions of certain items. So if you go out and you find one of these rare schematics, this will allow you to be one of the few players to craft said item or vehicle or whatever and then you can take those items that you make with those rare schematics and sell them on the player trading post. We got to see a handful of the game's dynamic world events. These include things like damaged spaceships and transports that will fall from the sky. These okay. leave a trail of thick black smoke. They will carry unique and valuable resources not found anywhere okay. else. So you will want to head out and salvage them. Perfect. You see one yeah, of yeah, yeah, for sure. Into the sands. However, this is also going to attract things like the sandworms and other players, which they said is used to create these tense situations where okay. you'll see this ship crash happening and you'll want to to go to it to get its valuable resources but you're gonna have to be careful is the sandworm was their attention drawn enough and are they coming are other players coming to kill you or not even just to fight you but even other players competing to harvest the, the limited resources that are on the ship that just crashed again all all used to try to create these tense dynamic moments other things they have for events include at the nighttime there are these large military ships that scan the planet looking for escaped prisoners which nice. you happen to be so you'll have to pay attention to where these ships are and when they're passing by and you you need to avoid this massive sweeping searchlight. The Highliner, an immense spacing guild. Highliner transports are a constant reminder of off-world scrutiny. Quick commercial break, everyone, to celebrate and give thanks to all of these amazing people who keep me on the air full time. Really appreciate the support. All you got to do is join as a member. You get access to private videos. You can also do super thanks on any upload or super chats and stickers on any live stream or premiere you see. And beyond that, don't forget we're multi streaming over on Twitch now, so you can support over there as well. Thanks so much to everybody. Let's get back to the video at hand. Without consuming spice, Maracas Guild navigators cannot foresee safe paths through space. Because if you get spotted, they will then send down an elite squad of NPCs to try to take you out. And I assume if you're good enough, you can actually deal with them. And there's probably some good rewards for doing that as well. And then, of course, another big event that you'll be dealing with is the sandworms. Um, they said that these exist well, you have to as run a constant from those. threat throughout the game. You cannot outrun them and you can't beat them because they're not an actual boss yeah, you can fight. You can't the only thing outrun you can try them. to do is avoid them and escape if you do uh, draw their attention. So as we mentioned earlier, when you're moving in the open sands, anything that you do while in this space will draw the attention of the sandworm. Now you're going to want to still go out into the open sands because there are a lot of valuable resources and loot there from those crashed ships, but also from the spice blooms. So there's a threat meter anytime you're on the sands that basically gives you an indication of how much attention you're drawing from the sandworms. Once okay. this gets high enough, the sandworm will then appear. You're actually going to see it bursting out from the sand making a loud, loud commotion. So if you don't see it, if it like bursts behind you, you'll hear you don't it. physically see it at first, you're definitely going to hear it. You turn around, you see the sandworm like coming up from the sands. And then at that point, it chases you uh, like a shark skimming the surface of the water, chases you with its mouth wide open. And the only thing you can do is to try to get away. You can't outrun it though. It's faster than you can potentially be. So you would either need to get into an air vehicle and fly away or try to get into the various uh, rock outcroppings, just basically island. Yeah, I was going to say, if you can get to the outrock rockers, you'll be sand, fine. And the sandworms can't go into the rock. So they can yeah. chase you on the sand, but if you get to the rock, you're safe. And that's basically the mechanic that you're dealing with. They did say there are items in the game, such as these thumpers, that can be used to distract the worms. Can you However, craft thumpers? once a worm is alerted to and starts chasing you, your only <laughs> option is to run. They follow you at high speed, skimming the surface with their mouth wide open until they catch up or until you escape to the safety of one of these rock islands. Now, next, the developer brought up the fact of uh, the, the fact that they're calling this game an MMO. They said, hey, people ask us all the time, why are we calling this game an MMO? What makes it an MMO? And to it's a which good question. Said, the game is a series of connected servers that are all seamlessly uh, interconnected with each other. And some of these include social server areas, such as these things known as player hubs. This appears to me to be very similar to how things like the tower work in Destiny. Here, you're going to see a large number of other people running around. Yeah, not just Destiny. Also, Anthem worked this way as well. But it's a it's a good system. If, if it works like that, I'm happy with that system because it means we'll be able to have, you know, this central place for 
social structures and social interactions, and then we can decide to go out on PvP adventures or decide to go out on PvE adventures and make a choice. This is where, besides other people, you will also find quest NPCs, trainers, merchants, the player auction house, <laughs> guilds, and factions. And that was pretty much all he actually said on the matter. He didn't go into further detail about what other MMO elements it has. Now, from this, I get the impression that outside of the social hubs, all of the zones in the game will make use of phasing. So they're going to have like a set limit to the number of people you're able to see in your particular version of that zone's server. And then it's likely in the PvP zones, they will allow for a higher cap of players to allow for that large scale PvP combat that they've talked about. But otherwise, it'll be somewhat limited in the PvE zones. Uh, you know, at this point, most MMOs nowadays use something like this. We're, we're Pretty very much rarely seeing all these of locked shards that just have like a set player cap and then everyone on that server sees all other players in that server. We see a lot more phasing where you might go into one zone and you're going to see people in that zone in your version of the server, but then maybe your friends could also be in that zone, but you won't see them unless you group up with them, or maybe the game does it dynamically so that anyone on your friends list always shows up in the zone, but it's phasing. It's not server shards. That's my, uh, that's my assumption from what he described here. All right. The next interesting thing we saw were these eco labs. Now these were described eco as labs. equivalent to dungeons in other games of this. The developer said he likes to think of them as the, like the vaults in fallout. They have been sealed for 10,000 years and when the war broke out in the game story people started exploring more and as a result they began to unlock and uncover okay so that that makes sense yeah, from a like dungeons they'll be distinct so hang on that's that's from a let's play fast and loose with the lore that's an interesting way of doing it, it it's totally it's and i um, i accept that this is why it's into under it's important for people to understand this is an adaptation of the books not a direct interpretation of you know not, not a direct copy of you know they're they're adapting and and doing things like adding these game elements to it which is fine areas where you go in you clear enemies and you collect loot sometimes there'll be bosses sometimes you'll go in and they'll be inhabited by tons of uh npcs from various enemy factions other times they'll be fairly undisturbed and instead give you uh various new interesting experiments puzzles and obstacles for you to try to overcome and they did say here that this gives them the space to play with ideas and locations different from the standard deserts above yep. introducing new landscapes and environments that aren't just sand absolutely everywhere in fact in in the one eco lab that they showed us it was like a tundra themed location there was a ton of ice Ooh. and like snow and frostbite all over the place really so yeah these eco labs are going to let them <clears throat> so, deliver yeah. an experience that isn't just sand all over the place which i think is really good because it's, that's probably one of it'll the break up the scenery had yeah. with this game like how interesting is it going to be exploring the desert for 100 hours well with the eco labs they are able to deliver biomes and locations that aren't just sand yeah there'll be small compact spaces rock, right? but so that's yeah. good there was a stretch of combat here. We saw a few minutes of combat with two characters working together. This also showcased a few different abilities. We saw the Mentat class use this ability that revealed enemy health bars, as well as what abilities the enemies had. We saw a suspenser grenade, which caused enemies caught inside to float suspended in the air. And then we saw the Mentat class also use this like dash or blink style ability where they teleported forward towards an enemy. And then the final thing that we saw was an example of the spice hunt. So spice is at the heart of everything in this game. It's a super Super valuable resource is and it's also going to be something that uh, my character is going to consume on a regular basis because i want the abilities baby i don't i don't, I don't mind the side effects I, I want the side effects give me the twitches baby used for a lot of things it's a currency so you actually use spice to pay your taxes on the land and the base that you've built but then also spice is used for some class skills and abilities as you progress and get more and more powerful so spice has to be harvested out in the desert and that's one of the things drawing you into the sands so at this point we saw a, a pair of players prepare and go out to harvest one such a pair of spice players not, not so first they actually people. constructed a transport ornithop okay so this is the difference this is a trans transport ornithopter that's slightly different but the cool thing is you're gonna have to craft your ornithopter which let them pick up and fly a spice harvester to a nearby bloom. The reason you want to do this is because the spice harvester is a ground vehicle and it moves pretty slow and if you were to just want to do hang on I want to go back this this right here is the kind of stuff that gets me really 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 excited about Dune Awakening because you have to build your harvester, you have to build your ornithopter, you have to fly out there, you have to risk it. It's a risk and it's it's interactive and 
this is more it's something that multiple people are going to be working we're, we are going to have so much fun with our co-op stuff like we're having so much fun in enshrouded right now and we uh, everybody that's playing enshrouded with us is looking forward to this game um and i think we have you know way more people interested in this game because it's dune and they know and love dune stuff like this is what we're going to eat up because groups being able to do this stuff together is going to be infinitely more fun up and fly a spice harvester to a nearby bloom. The reason you want to do this is because the spice harvester is a ground vehicle and it moves pretty slow. And if you were to just drive the harvester over the sand, you would never make it to the bloom before you attract the attention of the sandworm and got swallowed whole. So you use the transport ornithopter, you go up and you pick up the harvester and then you fly the harvester towards the blow that lets you then drop the harvester down and start harvesting. So while one player was doing that, the other player was up in the ornithopter flying in the sky and just scouting out, looking for enemy players that might be coming, paying attention to see for any signs of an upcoming sandworm. But then also at that time, while they were harvesting this location, we saw saw a sandstorm appear on the horizon moving very quickly towards the players. Now this was obviously a pre-scripted event, but the assumption is that while playing the game, it's dynamic and as you're playing, sandstorms will roll by. You don't want to get caught in the sandstorm because if you're not sheltered, it kills you. So what happened was, as the sandstorm came in, we saw the ornithopter pick up the harvester, suspend it in the air, and then start flying in the opposite direction of the sandstorm, trying to make it for cover. But of course, it wouldn't be dramatic if they didn't get swallowed <laughs> whole. So the sandstorm then came in, engulfed them, fade to black, and that was the end of the yeah. presentation. Again, clearly this was pre-scripted. It's not that just like a sandstorm just so happened to roll. It's for entertainment, you know, they baby. They set this up so that it happened, but it will be dynamic in the game. That is the assumption. You will just periodically get sandstorms coming in from different directions. You'll get some sort of a warning, I assume, or there will be a huge vi visual indicator to let people prepare, and then they will have to try to get to cover as soon as possible. So that is the whole presentation, basically. That is a rundown. Again, this was a gameplay presentation, so we were watching gameplay of the game being played in action where they showcase these various aspects of it. Uh, my early impressions from what we saw, you know, with the understanding that we didn't actually play, we didn't get hands-on time, but from what we saw in the presentation, some of the pros, uh, for starters, visually, I think the game actually looks pretty darn good. It's a far cry from the original presentation, the original gameplay trailers that we saw of this game, where I it's thought like it looked two, a three years ago. flat. Yeah. This thing is running on Unreal Engine 5, and it is pretty obvious from the textures and the lighting in particular. I thought this game was visually pretty darn good looking. I'll also say that the particular build that we saw looked to have pretty solid performance. I didn't see any obvious frame drops or performance hitches at any point in the presentation. Now, of course, that's this because it's Unreal 5 presentation. We also have no clue what <laughs> hardware that the game was running on. It's likely they were using a fairly high end rig, but still in a lot of these presentations, no matter the hardware they're using, you can still see with the early versions of games, pretty obvious performance issues and no, no such thing occurred in this presentation. That's because there's here. no LOD. I also like it's some of the uh, various systems and features so that they showcased. Unreal 5. I, I Unreal like this 5. like interactive harvesting where you actually have to trace along this line. I liked the various threats in the environment, the dynamic world events, uh, dealing with the sandworm, the sandstorms, uh, you know, ships falling from the sky. All this stuff looks and sounds really cool. Having to avoid the sun and stay in the shadows, like some really interesting systems uh, to keep the player engaged and to keep them on their toes while they're just exploring the open world. I also thought the abilities we saw were neat. I wasn't sure what to expect. I'm not super intimately familiar with the dune world but i wasn't sure how interesting rpg style skills and abilities we would have access to but we saw a levitate we saw anti-grav things we saw area scans we saw drones so it seems like a lot of sci-fi elements of, uh, rpgs open world rpgs and sci-fi yeah. variety of skills here which is good to see on the con side there were a few things as i mentioned some of the animations particularly as they relate to movement and parts of the combat looked a little stiff again i wouldn't say it looked terrible just that the animation animations felt a tad rigid. It may still very well feel good to play. I don't have any reason to assume it won't. I thought the gunplay looked and sounded decent, but yeah, just a little stiff here and there. That would be a one early critique. Also, uh, the way they've described the MMO elements, it's clearly not going to be a full-blown MMO, more of just a shared world, open world survival game. I think we pretty Which much I'm hopeful that, for that, because that means that I, I, won't, I probably won't have to do forced PvP. My assumption, PvP. again, is going to be that in the <laughs> PvP zones, when there is PvP conflict between warring factions or guilds, 
fields or whatever, that is going to be the highest density of players in one location. But as you explore all the other zones in the game, it's probably going to be fairly limited due to whatever phasing tech that they use. Also, speaking of which, uh, they didn't show any of the large scale combat, this, what they are calling combined arms, where you have hundreds of player, players running around fighting on foot with melee ranged weapons and skills, along with all the vehicles, the ground and the air vehicles. That's probably something they're going to be tanks and all that you stuff. Know, we didn't see any of this whatsoever. Tweaking it was later. all really refined to the perspective of one or two players playing in a group. Besides them walking around the social hub, we didn't see any open world exploration <laughs> or combat with more than one or two people. And we definitely didn't see that large scale uh, guild fighting that they, they are selling this game on. So maybe they're saving it for uh, future demonstrations. Maybe it's we've got more direct. Yet. Maybe in the current build. There's more dude direct events well. coming up. Who knows? So. But yeah, I would like to see that because that is one of the main selling points that they are pitching for this game. But yeah, there you go. That is the preview that we took a look at an early exclusive uh, event to see Dune Awakening. I like what I see overall as always. Hey man, I'm excited. Looking forward to new games. Hoping this is a good one as is always the case. But that is going to do it for this video. Thank you as always. Hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you guys next time. All right. Take it. That's pretty cool, guys. Um, so it's it's confirmation of some stuff that we had been waiting to hear on and it's just more of the good stuff that we've already seen um i'm happy to see you know he has a much bigger reach than i do so it's really good to see force coming out and covering this game i'm going to be championing this as much as i can on my channel i mean we definitely are going to be playing it together with our community and i'll be playing the hell of it just on my own um, I've been wanting to play it since I first heard of it because it's Dune and I love Dune. But I'm going to be happy to see any and all people coming out of the woodwork to cover this game because it's more visibility and it's more people playing and it's more people exploring and loving the Dune universe. So I'm really excited. Don't forget they have a Discord if you want to join. They also have a website where more information gets dropped all the time. The Discord is really active, so that's why I recommend it at the beginning. And you can always flag me down and say hi there. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon so you never miss an update here. Daily streams happen between here and Twitch. I play a lot of games. Check out the playlists. There's a Discord and a Patreon. I'll see everybody next time. Stay safe. Happy gaming.